You have 15 minutes left for your extended speaking time, if you wish to avail yourself. Should it please you, ma'am? Please proceed. Much obliged. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I notice the entire UNC bench has fled, not returned to the Parliament. So afraid are they of hearing the facts and the truth, Madam Speaker. I understand it. A few brave soldiers only out of shame have returned. They're not brave. But, Madam Speaker, they are the ones who probably want to hear the truth. So let's continue with the truth. The Honorable Member for Siparia stood here telling us that $110 billion had been spent in three years, telling us that this, this government has spent a massive amount of money, and what do you have to show for it, she said. Madam Speaker, I wonder if the Honorable Member remembers that the Honorable Minister of Finance had to come to Trinidad and Tobago, tell the country of the loss of 96% of our revenue, tell the country that we could not afford to have the wage increases that the UNC left behind. Because, Madam Speaker, the member for Siparia said about all the collective agreements done, the member was very careful to studiously avoid the fact that none of the OWTU collective agreements were dealt with. And what do I mean by that? The largest share of industrial relations collective agreements to be negotiated falling under the OWTU were purposefully left out by the UNC government because they wanted to prejudice them. And Madam Speaker, I want to today say to the people of Trinidad and Tobago that I wholeheartedly congratulate the Minister of Finance and the Honorable Prime Minister for managing this economy through the worst situation possible. You cannot possibly think that maintaining your civil service, your public service, your state enterprise employees is an easy task when you don't know where the next dollar is coming from. And if it wasn't for the prudent economic management to ensure that our petroleum tax regimes were renovated, where a wellhead tax was applied, where the unveiling of the $12 billion losses in the energy sector taxation regime was done, where the aggregation of oil and gas and bringing on Venezuelan gas to transform Trinidad and Tobago into the Qatar model, where we take gas from other fields and bring them and monetize them onto shore. If it wasn't for that, we would not have the position today where a Minister of Finance, in a disaster left by the member for Siparia, has the ability in a midterm review to come back and say, debt to GDP has fallen from 65% to approximately 55%. Now, Madam Speaker, I want to be careful to speak to the honorable people of Trinidad and Tobago through you. It's true that the Minister of Finance can demonstrate by data that the economy has turned around. It's true that we have managed to deal with the savagery of the member for Siparia's economic decisions, of that savagery upon the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It's true that Pointepe doesn't understand these things in the depth of it because he wasn't there. But Madam Speaker, the truth is that money has not yet trickled down to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. 
And I want to speak to our vision of diversification now and the benefit to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, the country is now poised to see a significant boom in our economy. And let me explain how. Let me explain how. If the member for Tabakit was here, he would understand. Maybe the member for Sawa Baratari understands. There are seven hospitals being built right now. Sangre Grande, Arima, Point Fourteen, St. James, redevelopment, yes. The redevelopment of the Port of Spain block. Imagine Point of Pair lives in Port of Spain and does not know where St. James is. <laughs> Madam Speaker, it's probably as good as his knowledge of Point of Pair constituency as well. But anyway, the fact is, five hospitals right there. Two of those coming, Madam Speaker. Hospitals come with beds. Beds come with orderlies. Orderlies come with doctors, nurses, sluicing, sanitation, moving. So in these thousands of beds come jobs. These projects are afoot. Second boom industry, the highway network that the honorable members opposite. Madam Speaker, let me put on the record. The attorney at law who is acting to block the highway in the development that we take to the east is none other than Anand Ram Logan, beneficiary of silk granted by self. Silk granted by self. In the UNC's mad lust to see Galleon's Passage never arrive, to see sandals never launch, and to see highways never built, the people of this country can be assured that with the highway expansion and development, the urbanization of rural Trinidad and Tobago brings economic benefit. <laughs> Hundreds of millions of dollars spent not on OAS, a foreign contractor that busts and run and left with a gift in its hand, a gift where the bankruptcy clause was renegotiated on the eve of an election and gone with the people money. No, local contractors being granted hundreds of millions of dollars staying right here in Trinidad and Tobago means that money will hit the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, let's come next to the next boom industry. The Minister of Finance, championed together with the then Minister of Housing and the Honorable Prime Minister and a, a team, a most incredible initiative on housing. And let me explain this, Madam Speaker. Two issues that plague people is rental and ownership of housing. Madam Speaker, if you look to the HDC and you look to the cost of developing a unit, if you look to the Victoria Keys development, under the hand of Oropuch East, and you look to the cost price of a single bedroom unit, the cost price is approximately $4 million. By the time you add land, infrastructure, the gutting of the finished apartments, the redevelopment of departments, $4 million for a single bedroom ground floor unit. $4 million. Who in Trinidad and Tobago in the low income bracket, middle income bracket, affords $4 million? So the state has to, for instance, at the St. James development, the Fort George development, the state ends up subsidizing housing by 2 to $3 million. By the time you sell it for $1.2 million or $800,000, the taxpayers of this country foot the bill for about $2.5 million. What did the Minister of Finance and the genius of the Honorable Prime Minister come up with? Let me explain this. In our budget... We came and we said, take land if you have it. Bring it to us. Fast track the development. If you don't have land, take state land. Bring it to us. Fast track the development. We, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, will guarantee you, if you build a unit, that you will get a selling point fixed. So let's say you bring land in, you're told, Build a house and you'll sell it for $750,000 or $800,000. $850,000, you know what your price point is. You tell the developer, you develop, which means save your costs. If you could build it for $500,000 and sell it for $250,000 more, you earn $250,000 in your pocket. But the government went further to say, take a tax holiday 
and we'll give you an incentive on top of that. Let's say it's $100,000. So the developer, the private developer, walks in, earns a profit on the selling price, earns $100,000 on top of that, gets fast track approval, people get homes because the state is no longer the sole developer of projects. The private sector jumps in. You get a list of people that own homes in Desire. The TTMF has a list, the HCC has a list of people approved with mortgages ready. So the government says, not only would you build this and we'll give you the incentives by tax break and by cash benefits, but here's the purchaser for you, approved by the TTMF, approved by the Home Mortgage Bank. That takes the subsidy, if you add $100,000 and another $150,000, let's say the state subsidy is $300,000. $300,000 is by far less than the $2 million you are subsidizing. And it allows private sector to step into the market to meet the needs of housing in a less risky environment where the government can't control project management historically. Siparia asked for vision. Maybe Siparia couldn't understand that vision because it is devoid of corruption. It is devoid of bacchanal. It is devoid of loss of... Of opposition. There's no bid rigging there. There's no waste mismanagement, Madam Speaker. It is the private sector managing itself. And maybe that is something which is incomprehensible to certain people opposite. I don't know. But to me, that is vision. Madam Speaker, I want to turn squarely now to San Fernando West as an example of enterprise and development. And I wish to thank the, the honorable members of the government for doing something which has never happened in San Fernando. Madam Speaker, we have talked about the waterfront development in San Fernando for 30 years. Madam Speaker, we've talked about improving our housing stock for umpteen years. Madam Speaker, I want to tell the nation today, and the member for Faisabad will know this well. San Fernando West, because he was at the San Fernando General, San Fernando West has on the waterfront where the PTSC garage is, the PTSC garage occupies almost four acres of land for derelict buses and garage facilities. Four acres on prime waterfront. Behind that is another three to four acres. Behind it, that's eight acres. To the right of it, if you head to Mbaka there, there are another five acres. Five plus four plus four acres of land, Madam Speaker, just wasted in bush, in garage facilities. And Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to say that the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago has vested the five acres of land into the HTC for housing development, which will commence this year, God willing. The cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago has blessed the multi-story car park at the base of the hospital this year, Madam Speaker. The, the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago has vested for the request for proposals into Udicott, the development of the four-acre site where the PTSC garage is. And Madam Speaker, for once the people of San Fernando West can look forward to local employment, to money circulating, to housing, to commercial development, to the beautification of our waterfront, Madam Speaker, because the Ministry of Works and Transport has already obtained the Certificate of Environmental Clearance for the construction of the seawall which deteriorated and the widening of the roadway. And that, Madam Speaker, is what you call vision. Whether it is vision for a constituency or vision for a nation. And that replication of vision is happening everywhere. It's happening in St. Joseph. Madam Speaker, my learned friend for Point of Pair mentions the train line and I would like to tell the good people of the Marabella train line that we are in the middle of conducting our survey to map out the people and their accommodation on the Marabella train line for the first time in 60 years so that they can own their own land, that they can live in dignity, that the police can, can, can patrol their communities in peace and in calm. But Madam Speaker, where was the vision for Siparia then? Why was Carolyn Sipasad Bechan, as the member for San Fernando West, put into the proverbial doghouse that not a blade of grass was cut in San Fernando? So, Madam Speaker, 
the replication of San Fernando West trajectory is happening in Maruga Tableland. It's happening in St. Joseph. It's happening in Laventil, where the people of Laventil are blessed with the dignity of having a swimming pool for the first time. Thanks to the honorable member for Laventil West. The people in Tobago look forward to the future of a diversified economy with an airport which is a foot right now. With a sandals project which is a foot. With a port at Soko which is a foot. And if the member for Sifaria doesn't have the clear sightedness enough to understand that that is vision, then we know why we voted out in 2015, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I ask the people of this country because we are about to unleash the power of what we've done, you know. Madam Speaker, thanks to the Minister of Finance and the Honorable Prime Minister, in writing the economy at the right point in time, we are now able to carry out this project delivery so that the people can feel the money in their pockets. And it will not just be the big contractors. And I want to tell the Honorable Member for Sipari as I wind up, it's not the one percenters I afraid, you know. It is the unnamed percenters. The 10 percenters or 30 percenters, the SISs of Trinidad and Tobago that run to Panama and hide in. They could hide so long, Madam Speaker, when our anti-corruption package hits this parliament in the next month or so, wait and see delivery. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Karen East Central. Karen Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the privilege and of responding, of making my contribution on this very important and timely, and I would say extremely relevant motion brought by the member for Shogwana's East, my colleague, <coughs> former Minister Fazal Karim. There have been many contributions before. I want to congratulate my leader of the opposition for her sterling contribution this afternoon where she went system, systematically into the areas of diversification and the state of the economy as it is today. And I want to congratulate all the other members of the opposition bench for their very incisive, knowledgeable, and practical presentations on a motion of really extreme national significance. One speaking about the urgency of jobs, which we have not had much discussion on, investment, and of course diversification, which we have been speaking on for this afternoon to a greater extent. So this motion has, whereas there has been a noticeable decline in the level of in, in investment in Trinidad and Tobago, and whereas there has been a failure of the government to create jobs opportunities, be it resolved that this House take note of the failure of the government to present a viable plan to diversify the economy and to place TNT on a path to sustainable growth. The watchwords there are noticeable decline in the level of investment. I will have some words to speak of on that. A failure of the government to create jobs, Madam Speaker, or job opportunities, and the failure of the government to pre present a viable plan to diverse, diversify the economy to sustainable growth. But before I go in my own uh, presentation, I want to respond to the member for San Fernando West, the Attorney General. First of all, I want to give notice to this rowley led administration and government that God has ordained May 24th oh. as your destiny. Oh. <laughs> You'll see what has happened yesterday in Barbados. A total wipeout, 13-0. Your fate and destiny is going to be short. Your fate and destiny is coming. <laughs> Honorable, the Attorney General started his contribution 
on speaking about flights of fantasy, revisionism, facts. Well, I want to say your, your entire speech, AG, has been a flight of fantasy. And uh, the facts that you spoke about are fake oil, fake, fake news, fake emails, your government, the rowling led administration is noted for these things that are false. So you are synonymous with fake oil and fake news and fake emails and so on. You spoke about the, the data shackled from the plantation economy. PNM administrations ran this country for 46, for 40, 41, no, 44 out of 60 years. 44 out of 60 years, from 1958 to 2018. That's 60 years. And PNM ran this country for 44 of these 60 years. And today, what can we say that we have diversified this country? How have we diversified it? What have we done being beyond the oil and gas sector? So 44 years, and you have done nothing. And you have come in here for three years, and you only talk is glib talk, and it's vision. Vision will remain as vision, and nothing will be implemented. The Honorable Attorney General, I, I hate to have to make this statement, well, that them. his entire speech tell them, tell them. was shameful. Yeah. Speaking of UNC administration and Kamala-led government, people are fed up about hearing about Kamala-led government. It is your time to act and to do the things that are required. You in there almost three years, and you cannot tell this country what you have done and what tangible benefit has accrued to citizens of this country. But you're blaming Kamala, blaming Kamala almost every day. Blame the judiciary. Member for yeah. Karani East. Sorry. That is precisely what I consider an infraction of the rules. Okay? Okay. So if you want to say either the Kamala honorable Kamala. member for Separia All right. or you want to say the Kamala Fasad Bisesa led government. All right, but what you've done there is precisely what I've said that I won't allow. Yeah, noted, noted leader. Thank you. Sorry, I'm um, uh, speaker. Then the, the member for San Fernando West spoke about the Point Lisa's development estate. And he spoke about the late Pri uh, Prime Minister Patrick Manning. It was not the late Prime Minister Patrick Manning who started the Point Lisa's. It was the late, late Prime Minister, Dr. Eric Williams, which started the, the Point Lisa. It was Mr. Manning who brought on the gas sector issues in Point, in, in point Lisa. And the Attorney General spoke about the DLP at the time did not want to have, the, did not want to get out of the lands, and they said, don't take away the lands. But I wonder if the Honorable Attorney General knows, well, he should know, that his grandfather was a member of the oh, DLP. No, so he must be probably thinking, well, his grandfather must be one of those who said um, they opposed the PNM at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's only a political history lab until when. Political history. I want to raise the issue of this 96% that the Attorney General has been speaking about all the time. 96% of what? Is it 90, he said 96% of revenue. That is false, Madam Speaker, totally false. He just throwing out a figure there, it's gross on truth, and it's not, it is not um, in touch with the real reality. We know that 80% of, of the foreign exchange comes from the energy sector. But there are many other areas which contribute to the revenue generated. So when he speaks about 96% of the revenue that is generated, comes, we, 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 we flitted it away 
that is totally untrue, and it, it's, um, it's gross untruth. And when they come to say to tell this country year upon year, budget statement upon budget statement, mid-year review, and the OJT Minister of Finance, who has this country oh. crippled, oh. is economic crippling of the country at this moment. Mm -hmm. People ha are not seeing their way. Thousands are losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. Businesses are closing down. Mm -hmm. And the, the Minister of Finance is beating himself in, on the chest and say, um, we have a reversal now. Uh, what's the name of the song? Clear, we see clearly now. What the people are seeing, they're seeing difficulties for themselves. They're seeing crime facing them. They're afraid to live in this country, and they're afraid to lose their jobs. Yeah. They're afraid to lose their jobs. The Honorable Member for Laventil West, who is the Minister of National Security, should be shameful about the statement that he just made a while ago. You are the Minister of National Security. Dismissive about murder. And they keep on saying that we had, they had three days in the bank account, of the bank account, three days to, to pay people money. When we demitted office, Madam Speaker, we left $117 billion ET for, this gov for their government. We left $11.5 in foreign reserves. And 5.6 billion US in heritage and stabilization fund. That is totally close to 11.5 and 5.6 is 17.1 billion US dollars, Madam Speaker. We left that in savings for the, with this wrongly led government to have at its disposal. $117 million, DT. And within a two-month period, when I speak about the overdraft, the overdraft being um, drawn down, within two, a two-month period, they were, able to, they were able to get close to about $8 billion from the sale of TGU, yes. Yes. three coaches, VAT returns, and a, no, a number of other areas, they were able to get close to $8 billion. Yes. So when they try to tell this country year after year, we left the country in ruins, in financial ruin. That is the most, the gross untruth, Madam Speaker. And that is a myth that they have been perpetrating and perpetuating for the longest time. And they're asking the people to buy into that. And that is gross untruth. So I have debunked that statement. I hope it resides in the minds of the people that the UNC Kamala Prasad led government left $117 billion in savings, and we came close to having nearly $8 billion available for them within a two year period. So that myth well and that gross untruth has to be put to an end. They said NGC raided $16 billion. NGC, $16 billion rated by NGC. NGC is a company that works for the people. The money is to be used by the people. And therefore, if they make a profit, the money is to be made for the people, for their, for, for the improvement of the quality of lives of these people. But when they criticize the UNC, the People's, Part the People's Partnership, for taking some of the funding from the, peop from the NGC for the benefit of the people. They are doing the same thing, Madam Speaker. They have, been, they have taken the NGC profits and been utilizing it. Hypocritical. And how hypocritical can that be? In addition, What did we take the money to do? Who built 104 new schools in the country? Who built the People's Partnership built 104 new schools in the country and had 70 schools at various stages of completion? We built 12 police stations, Madam Speaker. 
We built nearly 7,000 new homes in the country, Madam Speaker. Three hospitals, the Chancery Lane Complex, Medical Complex, the Coover Children's Hospital. We started the Arima Hospital. We started the Point Forte Hospital. And we constructed a number of new health centers. And we renovated almost 65 health centers throughout the country, Madam Speaker. In, ad in addition, I'm not uh, disturbed members, by them. I've allowed you some leeway. I generally don't have difficulty in hearing the member for Karen East. But I'm having some difficulty at this time. And I would really like to hear his contribution. Member for Karen East, please continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, I have almost 16 years experience in both in this place and the other place. Yes. I am not disturbed by them. I am I, I'm a old soldier just like many of them. So, Madam Speaker, they spoke about the incentives. So I have I have shown where in our five-year term, the amount of infrastructural projects that we have done with the close to 250 to 300 million dollars, they want to say that we spend 400 and something billion dollars over a period of time. It's a little less than 300 billion that we spent during the five years. So all the infrastructural projects across the country, it is there for us to see. What have they got to show for the three years? You could look east, you could look west, you could look north, you could look south, you could see, look central. You see nothing which they have done. They, they had left the hospitals for almost two years. They now start to work on the hospitals. And Point Forte Hospital already has some difficulty because they change up some plans there. And now they're beginning to believe that what they have done at the hospital in Point Forte they have um, destroyed some of the infrastructural strength of the hospital. So pretty, pretty shortly, you will see something coming out of that at Point Forte Hospital. They now started to, to, to continue. After two and a half years, they're now continuing the Arima Hospital because the people have been speaking and the people have been agitating for these things to be done. Then the, Honorable, the Attorney General spoke about Trinidad and Tobago invested in the footprint in Ghana and Uganda. It was under the People's Partnership Administration that members of the society who were very skilled in downstream industries began to go across to East Africa. In fact, Mr. Derek Hudson was one of the persons who was appointed in, East Af in one of the countries there as the head of um, well, what is now Shell. And many citizens of Trinidad and Tobago began to work in East Africa. So when they tried to take the plaudits for saying that they, the footprint of, of things in the energy sector outside of Trinidad and Tobago is due to them, that is also false, Madam Speaker. Then they went on to speak about the Chenier Company. Chenier. And they said that it was a, at the cost of the Patrick Manning administration, they were going to sign on with Chine, and we did not sign it on. And that is the United States government began to do the fracking and uh, began to get all, billions of um, cubic feet of gas to export. Almost every country in the world now has the ability to do fracking to get, sh to get shale gas. Some it might be more costly, and some it might be a little cheaper. So the issue of the United States providing gas to the rest of the world, it's a fact, but that doesn't prevent us from continuing to export our gas that we have exported. And the, and the member, in fact, alluded to that most of the gas that Chile buys is from Trinidad and Tobago.
we must remember that the benefits that this government receiving now and is now turning around, the economy is turning around as the finance minister says, but nobody else can see it, is as a result of the incentives given by the People's Partnership government on the energy sector to these major companies. And these incentives are the ones responsible for bringing on the Juniper project, where we are now getting over 400 um, bil um, million cubic feet of gas more, and uh, what is called TROC, T-R-O-C. So these two incentives were given so that Trinidad is now benefiting from the astute work and the incentives provided by the People's Partnership government. So all that they're saying, the, 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 um, everything is turning around now, and they, they're seeing clearly now is a direct result of the labor and the fruits of the People's Partnership government. They say we did nothing about transfer pricing, but you're in government for now three years. What have you done about transfer pricing? The Honorable Prime Minister and a team of one or two people go to negotiate with BP and BG and Shell and so on. Do they take on any technical people to write minutes of the meeting to see what is happening so that the general population can understand how it is they are coming to decisions about the price of gas and the price of oil. They deal with it, a prime minister and two other people deal with it by themselves. Where is the transparency and, 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 and probity in, the, in these matters? There is no one to answer. So we have to accept that this is the deal that they made and we have to say, well, all right, you feel that you have re-engineered the price of gas and oil with these companies, and therefore, this is what we have to accept. But it lacks the probity, the accountability, and the transparency, and the country could still be asking the Honorable Prime Minister to explain how we came around to those negotiations and how it ended, because these things are still very unclear. But if we talk about the economy has to grow, and the economy must move on. Madam Speaker, what has happened to this country so far? The crime is at its worst. And no country can prosper and develop when the crime situation is as it is. And therefore, no economic diversification and no economic restructuring can occur because of the crime situation. People are afraid to invest. New businesses are not coming in. Small and medium businesses are folding up. And people are losing jobs. Thousands of people are losing jobs. How can the economy grow when thousands have lost their jobs? Uh, Madam Speaker, we in the, in the UNC today and the last People's Partnership government, when we said that we created almost 50,000 new jobs in our ten, uh, five year period. I want to give you the central bank statistics. In September 2010, persons with jobs, 584,000. In September 2015, 628,000 in jobs. So that moved from 584 to 628. This is central bank statistics, 44,000 more jobs as recorded by central bank. What has happened since September 2015 with 620,000 persons with jobs? And the latest one I have here is June 2017, 602 persons with jobs. So 18,000 persons lost their jobs between September 2015 to June 2017. And today, we estimate that close to over 35,000 citizens of Trinidad and Tobago have lost their jobs. And the unemployment rate, I'm quoting 
the Labor Force Quarterly Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, 2008 to 2018. March 2010, the unemployment rate was 6.7. We, in December 2010, we brought it down to 6.3. In December 2011, we brought it down to 4.2. And in December 2013, we brought it down to 3.8. March 2015, it was 3.6. June 2015, it was 3.2. In June 2017, it went back up to 5.3, the unemployment rate. Thousands lost their jobs, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I have a voluminous documentation of newspaper articles showing the loss of jobs over a period of time. And of course, I echo the sentiments of my colleague, MP Karim, who said the economy is in tatters and 30,000 unemployed. Then on Guardian, April 21, April 21st, 2018, full tenure for 456 UTT workers. It's the same 456 UTT, UTT workers who have been fired. So no tenure there for them, they've been fired. UTT, OW, OWT in critical talks, 456 staffers to be regularized. Well, they regularized, they lost their jobs. Tube City, 257 workers worry of job loss. And Tube City is a, a company that had been um, giving ArcelorMittal support. Then, in April 10, 2018, Roger predicts more crime if UTT staff cutting continues. 140 million debt worries CPEP boss. Government toll cut 60 contractors. Unilever workers fear job losses. No worker is saved, jobs at risk, Roger, at a JTU meeting. Yeah. Madam Speaker, these are all 500 workers to be cut. Tobago URP facing financial woes. Roger, retrench managers instead. And the list goes on. TCL plans to lay off 100 workers, says Union. Alarm over Point Lisa's plant closure, 410 workers affected. More jobs coming, cuts coming at UTT. Roger, workers facing unemployment. 35 SSA workers fired. Spy agency sends home 35. 111 TDC workers get termination letters. 150 guidance counselors to be sent home. Rowley hints at public sector cuts. That means the contract workers. So, Madam Speaker, this tells the ministry, uh, Monday 19, June 2017, Ministry, 2,630 workers retrenched. Unemployment and TT falls, um, increases. 119 OJT administrators sacked. 150 jobless doctors on, uh, call on Kamuna for help. More than 4,000 retrenched between 2015 and 2016. Trade unionists, economists dispute Columns claim. That is the article on March 18, 2017. Workers fear more job cuts. 35 employees to be axed at the GHRS. Madam Speaker, I'm giving you the litany of the, the woeful areas under this PNM administration, everybody is losing their job. Oil belt services, 33 employees made redundant. Read it and the record. And then comes the ministry launches national retrenchment registered database. That is a false term. The Honorable Minister of Labor came to this parliament when people were losing their jobs and said that she will bring on the 
what is the act that is to help for severance fee? Retrenchment act. Nothing has been done. They're forming a registry to help people to get jobs. Who has got, nobody has gotten jobs from that. She failed to appear when Asila Mittal was folding up and they asked for a meeting with her. She refused to go to a meeting and 500 people lost their jobs as a result of her incompetence and her no care attitude, Madam Speaker. 700 and, and, and uh, being corrected, 744 lose their, lost their jobs. Then construction OS, 860 people lost their job. And SW, TT workers deliver letter to steel company. So Madam Speaker, that is a summary in a nutshell of people who have lost their jobs as a result of this rowley led government don't care attitude and approach and because they have not been able to do anything for the people. At one time we spent close to 150 million in three years, 150 billion. They have allocated close to $153 billion in the same, in the same three year period. And you cannot see anything. What have, they been, what have they done with that money? Or what are they doing with that money when thousands of people are losing their jobs? TSTT closed down nine retail outlets. RBC closed down six branches. Honorable member. Yeah. The original 30 minutes are now spent, and you're entitled to 15 more minutes. Thank you, Honorable Madam. Member, I just want to caution, this debate is not about loss of jobs. Okay, it's about a failure to create employment right. opportunities. So it might be a little switch, but it's a big difference. Sure. Please continue and be guided by that. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thrown that, because I have not seen any evidence of the ability of this government, the Rowley-led government, to create any more jobs. In fact, thousands have lost their jobs. Madam Speaker, I want to go on to the sec second area in my 15 minutes, the issue of divestment. And uh, no, there's a lack of in divestment, investment as well. That's, it, that's investment. Not divestment, investment. Before we demitted office in 2015, Madam Speaker, the investor confidence was intact. With major energy companies expressing their commitment to strengthening their ties with the country, investment climate was consistently strong. In the five years, confidence in Trinidad and Tobago's economy 2010 to 2015, and the energy sector had been expressed by major international players, including BP, BG, BHP, and Shell. They expressed confidence in our economy and in our work. In 2014, the CEO of Shell visited Trinidad after the historic acquisition of British Gas Group. And that Shell was committed to deepening and growing its position in this country based on the investment climate, which he saw as being very consistent and very strong. Such was the confidence then in foreign direct investment. All this confidence in FDI dissipated in just one short year of this rowley led administration. We had a 6.3 billion Caribbean gas chemicals investment in 2015. CGCL at the Union Industrial Estate Library. That marked the genesis of a new industrial estate, which was already complemented by the next door TGU power plant. The decision by the three Japanese companies, Mitsubishi Corporation, Mitsubishi Gas Chemicals and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, made a large foreign direct investment in the country on the other side of the world. And that was a testament to their confidence that these companies had in this country. They were creating 2,000 new jobs at peak construction, benefiting local contractors and every service companies. So when we speak about the inability of the PNM to create new jobs, this is an example of how we created 2,000 more new jobs. 
And in addition, labor, lease rentals, port charges, sale of electricity for that project have generated about $2.2 billion for the local econ economy, while foreign exchange earnings for the first 15 years estimated them at $4 billion US, near $28 billion TT, as a result of these three companies. Then that project stemmed from the visit then by the Japanese Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and the officials from the Mitsubishi Corporation, and financed by the Japan Bank for International Corporation and the Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi UFJ, which is Japan's largest bank. It was being built by a consortium of companies including Mitsubishi Corporation, Mitsubishi Gas Chemicals, Bassi Holdings Limited, an integrated chemical company limited, and a national gas company. So what can this government speak about today after three years there? The prime minister wants to go to China, but he only can meet the premier of somewhere. He wants to go to Australia, he's meeting the, the premier of Adelaide. He wants to go to Australia and New Zealand, and he wants to see Melbourne and New South Wales and Adelaide and, and Sydney and, and so on. He wants to see the cricket grounds. I'm a world cricketer. I listened to cricket from Australia since the 1960s. Oh, yeah. So the Honorable Prime Minister, we know he's a sportsman, but that's one of the things he wants to do as well. I want to read an extract from the World Investment Report 2060, 2017, an untard publication, an untard publication. That is United Nations Council for Trade and, uh, and uh, Divestment. It quotes, FDI inflows declined in the Caribbean with significant variation across countries. This was largely the result of a swing to net divestment in Trinidad and Tobago, reflecting the closure of the Point Lisa's facility of Arsenal Metal and lower reinvestment of earnings in the energy sector, while places like Dominican Republic was up strongly by 9% to 2 billion. So they began to send the money outside of Trinidad and Tobago and not, I'll give it to Dominican Republic. So the largest host economy, Trinidad and Tobago, the FDI inflows turned negative, negative. In 2010, the FDI, the foreign direct investment in Trinidad was around 550 million US. And when we debated office in 2015, it was close to 2 billion US annually. And in 2016, the Minister of Finance can prove me wrong and come one day and say that, it, that, that, invest, that divest investment, FDI, turned negative by $60 million in just one short year in 2016. And so our divestments, the foreign direct investments, took place in refined petroleum products and, national, and natural gas, or in extraction of crude petroleum and natural gas in 2012 to 2014. And so while this was going on around the world and there was money to be brought to countries who will benefit from their investment, Trinidad and Tobago was a recipient. I was just informed by Business Watch, yeah, that true. Forex was causing con a number of shops to close up, including Converse. Right. Mm -hmm. So I want to quote from the extract from the World Investment Report 2017, where the FDI flows by region and economy 2011 2016. 2011 Trinidad and Tobago, 55 million. 2012, 2.8 billion. 2013, 1.3 billion. 2014, 672 million. 2015, 406 million. And in 2016, minus 60 million dollars. And what we have now, Madam Speaker, we have loans taken out by the Prime Minister Rowley-led government and led by the Minister of Finance, who every year comes, comes to tell you 
that he has saved money. He borrowed $18.61 million billion between 20, September 2015 to May 2018. $18.61 billion was borrowed by the Minister of Finance and this wrongly led administration. In addition, they, they say raided. The Heritage and Stabilization Fund was raided twice. And they got almost 900 million US, close to 6.2 billion TT from the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. We took that Heritage and Stabilization Fund from 3.5 to 5.6 billion dollars US in our five year. We took the foreign reserve from 8, bi 8 billion US to 11.5 billion US in our five year period. And foreign reserves fell from 11.5 billion US to 8.3 billion during their time. So what the Minister of Finance has available to him and this wrongly led administration, borrowings of 18.61 billion, HSF of 6.2 billion, and foreign reserve of 20 billion, 45 billion they had more than they, they, they're supposed to have. So when this minister, when the minister, when the minister says that we spent 96% of the revenue and we frittered it away, they have close to $45 billion available to them as a result of their borrowing. Now the public sector debt, Madam Speaker, in December 11, the central government external debt to GDP, to December 11 to June 15, grew from 6.7 to 8.2 percent, a 1.5 percent increase in four years. From September 15 to December 17, the central government external debt to GDP grew from 8.6 to 15.3 percent, a 6.7 percent increase in the external debt to GDP under the short two and a half years of the, the Minister of Finance um, um, jurisdiction. A net public sector debt to GDP in December 11, in December 2011, was 33.6 uh, billion. In September 2015, it was 48.2 billion. So 14.6 billion more. And in, between September 15 to December 17, it grew from 48.2 to 61.6 billion dollars, 13.4 billion more. So, Madam Speaker, what we were able to do during our time, a report card, we, we had a heritage and stabilization fund at 5.7 billion, 60% more than it was in 2010. Foreign reserves grew to 10.5 billion and then 11.5 billion. The energy sector contributing 13 billion more to GDP than it was in 2010. The agriculture sector producing 5% more than in 2010. That is diversification. 26% increase in government revenues compared to 2010. Foreign direct investment increasing. Increased drilling rig days. 66% increased minimum wage compared to 2010. Increased pension, disability, and national insurance benefits. Increased tax collection with 19 billion in VAT receipts when the Minister of Finance came here in his first year as Minister of Finance, he said he will collect $12 billion in VAT because we knew that he couldn't collect it. And he made a, a, a bold assumption, which he knew was wrong. He collected, I believe, $5 billion in VAT. We expanded trade and export markets to Panama, Brazil, Guatemala, El Salvador, India, and China. And we increased opportunities for small business, leading to a growth in the sector from 6,659 small businesses in 2010 to 13,477 small businesses in 2015. Madam Speaker, in my last minute, I, I want to say how dismayed and hurt, angered, disappointed that the people of Trinidad feel as a result of this incompetent, wasteful government. When you look at the benches across there, you can't see one minister who is able to perform with some degree of competence and ability. 
And that is a mistake that Prime Minister, Minister Rowley made. He chose a bunch of young, incompetent people. That's why the government is floundering. It is floundering. Sorry, I take that back. Madam Speaker. Yeah. All right. <laughs> In accordance with Standing Order 53, I beg to move that the debate on private motion number one be adjourned. Honorable members, the question is that the debate on private motion number one be adjourned. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Statements by ministers. Honorable members, by agreement, which was recorded earlier today, we now revert to an earlier item of business. And I now call upon the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I've been authorized by Cabinet to make the following statement. On the Global Forum and European Union requirements. Trinidad and Tobago became a member of the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes, known in short as the Global Forum, in October, on October 4th, 2011. In 2011, Trinidad and Tobago underwent a Phase 1 peer review process. At that time, in 2011-2012, the Global Forum identified several deficiencies in Trinidad and Tobago's legal and regulatory system that hinders the country from effectively exchanging information in accordance with the international standards. However, no progress was made during the 2011 to 2015 period to address the shortcomings that would enable the country to progress to phase two of the peer review process. The shortcomings resulted in Trinidad and Tobago eventually being given an overall rating of non-compliant with international standards on exchange of information at the ninth plenary meeting of the Global Forum in 2016. The Global Forum required Trinidad and Tobago to take the necessary steps to bring the country in compliance with the current standards and to also implement the new Global Forum standards by June 2017. However, this could not be done within the short time frame. Trinidad and Tobago is expected to undergo, in June 2018, its second peer review. In this regard, the required legislation should be in place by that time. The rating of being non-compliant was one of the main contributors of Trinidad and Tobago being listed as, as a non-cooperative tax jurisdiction by the European Union last year. But it does not mean, as has been incorrectly interpreted by some commentators that Trinidad and Tobago has been declared to be a tax haven. We are simply not compliant in terms of the sharing of information with tax authorities in other countries. In addition to the shortcomings arising from the peer review process, the Global Forum has also adopted the automatic exchange of information as the new global standard for the exchange of information including banking information for tax purposes. Under the Automatic Exchange Framework for Reciprocal Information Exchange, financial institutions report information to tax administration in the jurisdiction in which they are located. The information consists of details of financial assets they hold on behalf of taxpayers from jurisdictions with which their tax administration exchanges, their tax administration exchanges information. The tax administrations then exchange that information. With respect to the Financial Action Task Force, Trinidad and Tobago, as a member of the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, has obligations under the Financial Action Task Force's 40 recommendations. During the fifth round of the mutual evaluation process, the Financial Action Task Force, fourth FATF, fourth, fourth round? Yeah identified a number of anom anomalies in our Income Tax Act, Chapter 7501, the Financial Intelligence Unit of Trinidad and Tobago Act, Chapter 7201, and the Proceeds of Crime Act, Chapter 1127, which necessitated amendments to the Income Tax Act, Chapter 7501.
FATF requires states to not only be technically compliant, but also to show that there is an effective meeting of obligations. Part of the effective requirements of the fifth round of the mutual evaluation process requires that investigations for the purposes of the Proceeds of Crime Act and the Anti-Terrorism Act be conducted without delay. This has also affected our compliance with the FATF 40 recommendations. To become compliant with Global Forum, the European Union, and FATF requirements, Trinidad and Tobago is required to have in place the legislative framework that would allow for the exchange of information and the administrative structure for that exchange. In this regard, two related bills have been laid before this House to address the many deficiencies, namely the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018 and the Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters 2018. It should be noted that it, it is our intention to lay a third related bill at the next sitting of this Honorable House dealing with the exchange of tax information between Trinidad and Tobago and member countries of the Global Forum et al. The bills will require a three-fifths constitutional majority of both houses for passage in Parliament. It is proposed, therefore, the, that the bills go before a joint select committee of Parliament for consideration and report, which was agreed to earlier today by this House. Second statement, Second statement Minister of Finance. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have been authorized by the Cabinet to make the following statement. The Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Bill 2018 is principally intended to modernize and fortify the collection of revenue through institutional strengthening, focusing on accountability and greater efficiency. The benefits of our Revenue Authority include public revenue enhancement reflected in higher tax ratios and real revenue growth, greater efficiency in public resource utilization via financial and administrative independence and managerial autonomy, reduced tax evasion, thereby improving the credibility of taxation in particular and the government in general, improved taxpayer services and reduced taxpayer compliance costs, improvement of administrative culture to a more service-oriented organization, comprehensive accounting for all tax, tax revenues, integration of tax and taxpayer-related databases. The deficiencies in the current system include deficient human resource management processes, inadequate management capability, accountability, and training, inadequate staff development, training, and accountability, lack of control over and accountability for budgetary allocations, inadequate employee compensation packages, tax evasion, inefficient systems for internal investigation and enforcement, inadequate information exchange and coordination between the administration of various taxes levied, unsatisfactory customer relations, rules and regulations that are not conducive to the ease of doing business, lack of appropriate information technology system, poor physical infrastructure and accommodation, and deficiencies in the legislative framework. It has been the government's stated policy that the introduction of a revenue authority in Trinidad and Tobago will boost stability and investor confidence and is necessary for budgetary reform. Throughout the Caribbean region, we observe that in recent times, some of our counterparts have implemented revenue authorities as an important step in revolutionizing revenue collection. It is expected that the revenue authority can significantly enhance tax administration, generate additional revenue, create new jobs, and increase revenue collection by up to 3% of GDP or an additional $5 billion per year. According to agencies such as the World Bank and the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF, Trinidad and Tobago continues to receive poor ratings with respect to the collection of taxes. Our planned establishment of a revenue authority should contribute to a decided improvement in Trinidad and Tobago's rating. The authority, Mr. Deputy Speaker, will allow greater transfer of information between the Board of Inland Revenue and the Customs, which is needed to reduce the incidence of tax evasion. The new institution will also allow for tax administration to be supervised by an independent board, which will be responsible for introducing high quality and accountable management. We estimate the increase in revenue collection in the first year 
after the proposed revenue authority is fully established to be in excess of $300 million, rising exponentially thereafter. As the Deputy Speaker, experience in the region and elsewhere has demonstrated the benefits of having an integrated revenue authority as the core of the tax administration system, as it brings together the Board of Inland Revenue and the Customs and Excise Division under one administrative umbrella. In light of the above, I have laid the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Bill before this House. The bill requires a three-fifths constitutional majority, and as such, as was agreed earlier today, the intention is to have this bill examined by a joint select committee of Parliament. I thank you. Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that this House to now adjourn to Monday, the 20th day of May at 1.30 p.m. Mr. Deputy Speaker, at that time, we will do the Senate amendments to the Evaluation of Land Amendment Bill and the Property Tax Amendment Bill. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Honorable Members, there is one matter that qualified to be raised on the motion, on the motion for the adjournment of, before the adjournment of the House. I will now call on the member for Kearney Central. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am very grateful that I have the opportunity, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to present this motion today. The motion is the urgent need for the government to address the safety and security of citizens in public spaces in the communities where they live, conduct business, and congregate to engage as human beings to nurture community and to build society. In my view, given the state of affairs in the country, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is an important motion and I hope that the government will respond in a constructive manner. I am very sorry that the substantive minister of national security is not here. Uh, but I hope I will get a response that is deserving of the issue that I am raising. What triggered this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, was the invasion of the home of Pandit Gajendra Kumar of the Lakshmi Narayan Temple at the top of this central range in my constituency of Karani Central. And when I visited there this Sunday morning, in spite of the fact that he had come forth bravely and conducted service, one could tell that the experience of the morning before had been a very trying one. And I couldn't help but empathize with him as a person in that situation. But then I reflected as I was driving from the temple and I remember that Pastor Noel Suhan, who also lives in my constituency and conducts the Faith Assemblies Church in Arena, had also been robbed and had almost every piece of technical equipment that, you could, that he had had in the church taken from him. And I remembered as well that Father Harvey of the Catholic Church had in fact been assaulted in the church some months before, less than a year before. And I realized that what had happened or what has been happening is that the boundaries, even the boundaries having to do with crime, had in fact been surpassed, had been broken. And I mean, I felt an awful sadness, really, to think of where our country had come and what was happening to my own constituency. You see, my constituency has a number of very, very small communities, Presal, Grand Hoover, 
Flanagan Town, Mamoral, Caparo, Palmer Studge Road, Londonville, Montrose, Edinburgh 500, Chicklan, Carlson Field, Arena Road, Uquiri Road, Seudas Road, Christian Village, Nelson Road, Freeport Mission Road, San Francisco Settlement, Indian Trail, Bosser Village, La Quesa, Thompson Road, and lately, recently, Cashew Gardens. And some of these communities have produced a lot of things. I can't go through every constituency, every uh, community here, and what they have done, but they produce food. They are hardworking people. They pr uh, Presal alone has produced here 15 cricketers of national note, including two national women's cricketers. Presal alone, and about six people who in fact played for the West Indies team. So this is a community that is hardworking, committed, and generally focuses on constructive things. You will see that in my motion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I talked about nurturing community and building society, and these people are community nurturers. They are society builders. They are institution builders, and therefore, to have a situation in which their villages, their communities, their homes are being invaded is really not a very nice thing in, uh, at all. And what they are really, because being unarmed and unassuming and simply constructing their business to suit the development of their community, they have become vulnerable communities. And it makes me really upset to come here to deal with this motion and I know that what is happening in Kearney Central is happening everywhere else in the country, all over central Trinidad, in every corner of Trinidad and Tobago, east, west, north, south, Tobago here. And I know that it has become a prevalent situation and a situation which has caused a lot of fear in the country. Yesterday, if you read the papers in the Newsday, you will read a headline, Freeport Family Tied Up, Beaten, and robbed. And what is very interesting is the reporter who would have been perhaps somebody who does not live in that central area, uh, Stacy Moore, she writes the article and she quotes a member of the community who is affected by all of this. And the member of the community said, I would have never thought that in this quiet village of Uquiri this would have happened, but I am thankful they are alive. Now, the village of Uquiri is remote, and if you don't know the area, um, you wouldn't know its community life, and you really would have to search for it to find it. But there are temples there, there are churches, etc. And now, in this situation, you have a situation where traditionally we used to thank God for life. Today we have to be thankful when the bandits let us live. We have to be grateful when they just take our money and our possessions, and we have to feel specially blessed when they do us no harm. That is where we have come in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I have a list here. This list is 17 pages for the activities in my constituency that are destructive of life, limb, community, and homes and places of worship and other public places. And this is for the month of late April and May alone. This is in one constituency. I have a letter here from one of my constituents. I won't expose him by reading his name, but he says further to my correspondent, so and so and so, I am humbly asking that you use your good office to create some level of awareness to the powers that be. I am very fearful that some residents may choose unconventional means to keep their family safe. Then so what has happened in an unarmed community, in a situation in which they are exposed, where they are being invaded, you are now getting to the point where the thinking in the country is that we have to protect ourselves. And you are getting a kind of vigilante psychology emerging okay which is very, very dangerous for the society. And Madam Speaker, I want to warn that in this kind of situation, 
I feel that we have reached a point where we cannot have patience anymore. I do not have any patience anymore, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think the Minister of National Security has severely failed as a Minister of National Security. Because he has failed to do what is required of the Minister of National Security, which is to give people a sense of security, to protect the borders, to be able to give the, con the community a sense that they can walk in peace and in fear. And imagine where we have come. We have come to a situation where the people of this country who now cannot go out in the night anywhere, who cannot take their family anywhere, who cannot do anything in public spaces, are being invaded inside their homes and their temples and their churches. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, I feel that the time has come really to ask the Minister of National Security on behalf of the government is either come to the country and tell the country what you are going to do to bring back a sense of peace and security to the citizen, or don't wait for the Prime Minister to fire you. Resign now. I recognize the acting Minister of National Security. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the government is responsible for ensuring the safety of the citizens of this country is beyond dispute. This is our constitutional responsibility and our moral authority as the PNM. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we understand as well that criminality and disorder very often appears to threaten the safety and to threaten, sorry, the well-being of this society and to, get out of, and, and to get out of control. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what then is the responsibility of the government? As part of this parliament, our responsibility is to present bills here and to get them along with our colleagues passed in order to provide the legislative framework so that the law enforcement can do their thing. Sometimes we get the support here, sometimes not. But support or not, we are determined to tackle this problem and to treat with it, and we are confident we will fix these problems, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Bearing in mind... But again, please, I'm not tolerating. Proceed. Bearing in mind that regardless of what we say here, the police service is the only organization under the Constitution and the law that is designed to treat directly with this crime problem. So we could shout, we could scream, we could say what we wish. We have to rely on the police service. And this is why the government, through the National Security Council, and certainly through the Minister of National Security, interfaces regularly with the leadership and other ranks of the police service to provide them with the support to find out what their concerns, their challenges are and to provide support, technical assistance, training, and resources so that they could get on with the job, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When that was done, some people shout waste of time, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but it is necessary because we have to rely on the police in order to do it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, before we came to government, we offered this country a 10-point crime plan, the first of which we told them they'll get our parliamentary support if they would come with measures to improve the appointment of a commissioner. That was not done. We told them of the need for a manpower audit. That was not done. As soon as we came to government, we instituted a manpower audit committee. It did its work led by Professor Deo Saran. It reported to the government. We brought it to the parliament. It went to the Joint Select Committee on National Security. And we are just about to issue our final report for the consideration of this house for the implementation of the terms of that report. That's what we are doing. We take a whole of society, whole of government approach. And as such, we focus on the Ministry of Social Development as well, improve social service delivery, because we understand police alone cannot attend to this long-standing endemic social phenomena that is crime. We are focusing on community development, focusing on education, focusing on the provision of affordable housing, focusing on sport and culture, and continued support for NGOs, CBOs, and faith-based organizations. 
largely focusing on the young people and the at-risk groups in the society because the police have told us when we consult with them that it appears as though there's a greater and greater army of young people who are susceptible to criminal um, in, uh, encouragement and participation. The expansion of youth organizations like the Cadet Force and the network of police youth groups are some of the examples of that kind of activity. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the police reported to us that there's a shortage of manpower. Right now we are looking again at being able to recruit in larger numbers simultaneously to supplement the police service and of course to bring the numbers up by at least 1,000. We are in discussions with them on that because they are telling us part of their challenge is that they don't have sufficient manpower. And the manpower audit report reflected on some of this. We are also in the process of recruiting 1,400 municipal police officers to supplement the regular police service. They will focus on community like the members spoke about, community crime, community issues, and that will free up the national police service so that it could do investigations and core aspects of policing, kidnapping and investigations and arresting criminals and that sort of thing. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is the sort of approach that we are taking. The police cannot be everywhere. People have to take some personal responsibility for themselves as individuals and for their spaces. The government wrongly condemns, therefore, the robberies, the larcenies, and the sacrilegious attacks on places of worship and on our religious leaders or persons in such places. We condemn it as much as we condemn infringements of people's constitutional rights on religious grounds by what they wear and their own practice. The government condemns all of that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we sincerely commiserate with the experience of the pundit as was raised by my friend for Karani Central, and I hope that the police are able to pursue the perpetrators as they did in the Father Harvey matter to capture them and rest on them the full brunt of the law. My, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the judiciary has a role to play in this as well. They must hear and determine matters quickly. Our efforts to reform the criminal division of the High Court or for a reformed criminal division of the High Court is another important initiative which should find itself before us for consideration shortly. A slap on the wrist by the judiciary for serious criminal offenses does not boost police morale or public confidence. Imagine after hours of surveillance and hard work and planning, the police find a heap of cocaine and a small fine, and an individual is about to walk away. I hope the state appeals in those circumstances, but that serves to destroy police morale. But as though they were resilient, they went this morning in Northeast Trinidad, put on another major successful exercise, seizing a major cache of guns and cocaine. And I hope that the courts, when it has its opportunity, do not offer a mere slap on the wrist. As I said, we comm commiserate with the pundit spoken of here and the attack that he had to endure, he and his family. We commiserate with Father Harvey as well. Very, very shortly, I can assure you, we have already drafted it. This parliament will have to consider matters of law dealing with home invasion, forcible entry, and forcible detainer of people's property. So the issue of home invasion is on the agenda, and very shortly, the parliament will be giving consideration to those matters. I want to congratulate the police, recognizing that we as a society could never pay those men and women under arms for the work that they do, all hours of the day and night, taking great risk and great trouble in so doing. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, I urge them to continue their work. We know it is only that organization that could do it. We could talk as we want from this parliament. It is the police, and that's what we are working on as we speak through a joint select committee on which my friends on the other side participate. We have a series, a, a, a CCTV network operating, not as efficient as it should be. And right now we are in discussion with the private sector so that they could come on board with us. They too could set up their systems, link it into the national system, so we will have eyes everywhere. Evidence is, evidence is that cameras have helped substantially in other places, and that we are about to do. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in closing, permit me to reiterate that this government in keeping with our responsibility to make the society safe, 
will get the job done. We will do so with or without the support of our friends in our position. We are aware, we are fully aware that we are all challenged. Citizens, law enforcement, the courts, we are all challenged. Yet, we are determined to do the job. And by God's grace, Mr. Speaker, and with the support of the members of this society, in the spirit of goodwill, we are confident we will get the job done. I thank you. Honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn. I can wait on you all. No? Honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to Monday, 28th May, 2018 at 1.30 p.m. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. This house now stands adjourned to Monday, 28 May, 2018 at 1.30 p.m.